Our next speaker tonight is Dr. Seth Ward. And Seth, um, well, let's start with the usual obvious stuff that we usually introduce people with. Uh, Dr. Ward earned his PhD from Yale University, he did further work at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He taught for six years at the University of Haifa, and then at Denver University, before coming to the University of Wyoming in 2003. He's lectured in countries around the world, the ones that I happen to know about, apart from um, the US, is Canada, and Israel, Azerbaijan, and China. But let me put a different light on it. Um, you know, Seth, he's been my colleague for, what, 13, 14 years now. He's a teaching machine, OK? He not only enjoys teaching, enjoys being in the classroom, when he gets out of the classroom, he's with students all the time. He makes, he divides his classes up into, into learning groups, and then he has learning groups come in and have conversations with him, okay? His students actually come to office hours. I hold office hours, I get a lot of work done in office hours, let me tell you. <laughs> Seth holds them, people come in as individuals and talk to him, they bring their work groups in or other organized groups in and come in and talk to him. Um, and then, you know, just teaching students isn't enough. So he signs up for the Wyoming Humanities Council uh, State Lectures Bureau, and about twice a year, he travels around the state and gives talks, big towns, little towns, bags. I mean, he's been there, okay, <laughs> done a talk. Um, and then, when the semester ends, at the end of May, Seth throws about a dozen students on a plane, takes them to Israel, and for the next two weeks, 24-7, he takes them around Israel and teaches them at every moment. The only way they can get away from learning from this guy is to go to sleep. <laughs> at UW, uh, Professor Ward is our expert in Islam. And uh, he also is known for his comparative courses, teach Judaism and Christianity. One of the best ones that at least gets a lot of play is his upper level course on Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, mm -hmm. a course that compares the three founders of religion. Uh, however, tonight, Seth has settled in here. He's not going anywhere, at least not for the next 45 minutes. And he's going to give you an introduction to Islam for the equality state. Seth. Thank you very much. <clears throat> This is, in fact, a talk that I have developed for the Wyoming Humanities Council, now Think Why or Wyoming Humanities. Normally, I would have a page that thanks all the members of the council as well as all the other sponsors. Uh, you're going to have to limit it to the page that you see up there. And this page over here tells you a little bit about some of the courses that I teach. I have just put them down arbitrarily. You will see my students in the summer course, this is actually an archaeological site that at the time Professor Flesher was associated with. Uh, indeed, Paul said that the only way they can get away from me is sleeping, but at least two of the t uh, days we didn't sleep in some of the things. We had all night activities or something like that. Islam is the religion of more than a fifth of the world's people. It's often considered the fasting, fastest growing religion in America. Mormons will argue that it's uh, Mormonism. I like to remind students and anybody else that if you believe the Pew Research uh, findings, none of the above is probably the fastest religion. And you should keep that into context with that. Nevertheless, Islam is quickly growing in the United States for all sorts of reasons. <clears throat> and is a continuing source of interest and something with that all of us should know much more about than we do. Arbitrarily, when I talk about Islam, I try to talk about practices and beliefs. I try to talk about scripture and spirituality. I'll talk a little bit less about spirituality this evening. I try to talk a little bit about the American situation. I have a few maps and charts about the situation specifically in Wyoming and very briefly, I'll talk about what's probably the most important thing, but we need to get the basics down pat first. The political and religious goals which motivate Muslims, both activist adherents, and I should say 
and the majority who are very happy to live lives suffused by religion and family and all the other very important goals. Um, in any case, what are the religious goals which make it into the news? But I'd like to start with a definition or two. Muslims would generally define Islam, an Arabic word uh, that means submission, as submitting to God's will. The word Allah, as we'll see, or I'll say a number of times probably, Allah simply should be understood as God. People who say, well, they don't believe in the same God, this is, like, this is a very silly kind of way of looking at it. If one is arguing about Allah, they don't believe the same things about God, that may be true. But Christians and Jews and anybody else who speaks Arabic uses the word Allah uh, the way in English we use the word God, period. Also, I will refer to believers as Muslims, sometimes a Muslim, a female believer, uh, the religion I will call Islam. I will use Muslim or Islamic interchangeably as adjectives. Don't use the word Islam as an adjective. So I won't make any difference, distinction between Islamic practices or Muslim beliefs, although some people do, and if we have enough time, you'll hear about some of the ways in which this is done. Uh, Professor Flesher's teacher, Jack Neusner, died earlier this month. And I thought it would be good to start with Professor Neusner's typology of how one looks at a religion. He published, well, I don't know, it's in, a, a, in only 10 or 15 percent of his books, but that's like a dozen or two dozen or three dozen volumes. He talks about ethos, ethics, and ethnos. And one of the places I copy this from is a book called Judaism, The Basics, but thanks to Google Books, I quickly found, I think, a dozen or so where he talks about this issue. In any case, he tries to define religion as a cultural system, and he talks about the ethos of a religion as the worldview that defines it. When he talks about Judaism, he actually doesn't talk about God first, he talks about Torah. And so I'm going to suggest not only Allah, but also Quran, the revealed word of God, and how that's understood. Hopefully, within the next few minutes, we will be a little bit wiser about how that works. He defines ethics more broadly than simple moral choices in some sort of philosophical system, but the way of life and how one defines virtue. Now, for Islam, I would say this is not only the Quran, which has stories and laws and narrative and poetry and spiritual uh, uh, words and things which Muslims often talk about as enveloping them in God's word. Also there is Muhammad and his practice and there is something I'm going to call jurisprudence, the technical terms for jurisprudence uh, from a point of view of a legal definition would be kiyas, which we would define as uh, analogy, although a more specific translation of kiyas that is how it's understood would be applying legal principles to determine law from Quran and from what Muhammad said or did or what was done in his presence. And the second half is a sense of the community of believers coming to a kind of consensus, the Arabic term is ijma, uh, consensus about what Islam is all about. Those things put together, Quran, the practice of Muhammad, and Islamic jurisprudence create a word you probably have heard quite a bit about, Sharia, which is the way of life. To use Neusner's terms, the definition of virtue, the way of life, a system for determining what is required, what is prohibited, what is recommended, what is reprehensible, and what is neutral uh, for any possible action by any possible actor. The third thing on this idea of ethos, ethics, and ethnos uh, is the idea of a people, a community or a social entity that takes shape among the believers. For the Muslim world, this is the nation of Islam, or the ummah is the Arabic term. It's interesting, of course, I'm sure Neusner used the E's as opposed to the D's, but ethnos, a community of believers 
is not quite the same thing as the demos that we heard before. It's not the entirety of the people. It's a community and it's a system in which the cultural system is not necessarily limited to, but it has a place that's based on God's concern for the group and the group's concern for God. That I added to what Neusner wrote in this particular source. That's what marks the system as religious and not secular, and it's also typical of Islam. Uh, the idea is also found in other religions. We could talk, for example, in, for the Jewish world, Abraham Joshua Heschel talks about man's search for God and God's search for man. Those are not the exact titles that he used, but the idea of the human and the divine being working together to make the world a better place or to determine action is a nice way of looking at it. So we are going to try to spend a little bit of time on Allah, on the Quran, on the system of ethics and Sharia, and what it means to have a Muslim community. My next slide is a map which shows where the Muslim community is. This was developed by <coughs> the Pew uh, Research uh, 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 Center. It was on religion and public life. It was dated to 2009. And this is a kind of map that shows the population size rather than the geographical size of various countries. One looks at it very quickly and one sees that although we think about Islam as a Middle Eastern phenomenon and specifically an Arab phenomenon, over half of the Muslims are from, actually well over half of the Muslims are from Iran and eastward. Iran is Persian, they're not Arabs, and they're not Middle Easterners. Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Malaysia, all those places are not even Middle Eastern. And they have the overwhelming majority of the Muslim world. South Asian, Southeast Asian. Uh, the China is shown here with only 22 million Muslims. Some estimates include some of the traditionally Muslim Chinese, and in the past 10 years since the research was done, the Hui people are identifying in Islam in ways that my colleague Michael Brosey has shown are a lot more vital, a lot more robust than I think was the case even 10 years ago in terms of the Islamic identification. Uh, in terms of the Middle East, Egypt is an Arabic-speaking country. It has the largest population of that area. But Turkey and Iran uh, are not Arabic-speaking countries. They are not Arabs. And again, we need to think about Islam as being a world religion that although the Arabs have a kind of priority, it is not a priority that's based on their numbers but on their history. I'm going to turn now to a classic way of delineating some of the basic principles of Islam. My students need things that are simple for them to go on their path towards learning about Islam. And I often use a story about Muhammad being visited by a strange visitor from another planet. That's not exactly how the text says it, but this was a guy who comes in from the wilderness. He was wearing pure white. There were no signs of travel. Today, yeah, you're in your Cadillac, you come in and uh, you won't have sand in, uh, in your feet and in your hair and your clothes won't be messed up. In those days, they didn't have Cadillacs. Uh, they didn't have stuff. You came in walking or on a horse or a camel. Uh, you, would, you would show signs of travel. So the story already sets this man up, this visitor up, as being an unusual visitor. He asks Muhammad about Islam which here we have to translate as the small meaning of Islam, or I should say the broad meaning of Islam, submission to God, as well as the small meaning, meaning the basic principles of the religion that we call Islam. Earlier I mentioned to you there are different ways of looking at the word. You might say the large meaning of Islam is anybody who submits his will to God's will. The smaller meaning, the more specific one, are these five principles, they're often called the five pillars of Islam. <clears throat> if you were in my class, you would learn that the fact that this version of the story has the five pillars the way we understand them today shows that this is not the earliest version of the story. So too, 
the fact that we have the strange visitor rather than a Bedouin shows it's not the earliest version of the story. I'm going to restate this. The story was told and retold and retold so that it became, you might say, a catechism, catechismic type of way of teaching the basic principles of Islam. So the basic submission to God is testifying there is no God but God and that Muhammad is the messenger, establishing prayer, paying alms, observing the fast of Ramadan, and performing pilgrimage if you are able to. The second set of questions had to do with faith. Here the basic principles of faith are six. Belief in God, angels, by the way my students always spell this word A-N-G-L-E-S. Uh, STEM education has at least this tiny bit of success. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, a basic belief in angles. I mean, why not? <laughs> Books, apostles, the day of judgment, and the divine decree about good and evil. I'm only going to talk about, I mentioned a little bit about Allah before. I'm going to mention that prophets include, for Muslims, most of the familiar Jewish and Christian prophets. Uh, the question of judgment and divine decree is a conundrum for all religions. Uh, in Islam, the way this conundrum is usually set up is that if God knows what will happen, it must necessarily happen. Nothing happens without the divine will. That's the question of divine will, divine power, and divine knowledge. If so, as I say to my students, if I were to get up and punch you in the mouth, you couldn't complain to the provost because it was God's will that you'd be punched in the mouth. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to do it. But in Islam, you are also judged for your actions. The dominant solution to this problem that emerged within three centuries was that God is the only real actor, but we acquire our actions and we are judged on our acquisition of those actions. The third set of discussions was about what is the good deeds, and ihsan means doing that which is beautiful. The prophet told the questioner, Worship God as if you see him, because God always sees you, even if you don't see God. You should always live your life as if you are in the divine presence. The reason I call this the introduction for the equality state is not only about some of the egalitarian verses I hope to look at in a few minutes, but because of the question about the fourth set of questions, which was about the purpose and the goal of history. Tell me about the day of doom, the day of judgment. Uh, the prophet told the questioner, neither you nor I know anything about it. So tell me what you know about the signs of it. And I am interpreting this a little bit tendentiously for the equality state. The slave girl gives birth to her mistress and her master. Mistress and master, slave girl, free thing, that's equality. And the barefooted destitute goat herds, sometimes I use Bags, Wyoming as an example. I don't know whether they have destitute goat herds. But the people who tend sheep in some godforsaken corner of Wyoming are going to be equal to guys, I'll use the politics, like uh, Donald Trump, who build these big, big, magnificent buildings and have millions or billions of dollars or whatever it is. Economic equality also being indicated as a goal of history. The day of judgment will come when the slave girl and her master are the same, when the girl and the, the fe female girl and the master male are the same, when the impoverished shepherd and the builder of magnificent buildings are the same. Uh, we find out that the inquirer was the angel Gabriel. <clears throat> and the point of the narration is to ground religion in some sort of an angelic uh, 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 discussion, discourse. In other words, the angel confirms that this is in fact the right way to understand religion. We're going to look at some of these things in somewhat greater uh, detail to the extent we can in the short amount of time we have tonight. So the five pillars are testimony, prayer, fasting, alms, and pilgrimage. The image here is a version of the Shahada, the testimony, and a, an image of the Kaaba, the central shrine of uh, Islam. So the testimony has a number of parts. The first one 
There is no God but God. In Arabic, Allah, a generic term for God, Allah, which we could debate linguistically, is it the God or is it an ancient divine name which was the basic name of the master of the Kaaba or is it a generic word related to Elohim, Allah in, um, in Aramaic, which in Bible and I think Elaha occurs in Targum as well. That just means God. And there's no real other way to translate it. Uh, there's also other ancient divinity names, and one could, could give a prehistory of the term. But, you know, it's fun. We take the prehistory of the Greek meaning of, I uh, use democracy, not to say there's something wrong with it, but we have to realize that just because we can parse the Greek meaning, sometimes this is useful and sometimes the meaning in English goes in a different direction. Meaning in Arabic for Allah is God. It's not a personal term, it is God. Muhammad is part of the second uh, uh, Shahada testimony and a very specific thing that said, Muhammad is the messenger of God. And not here one of many prophets, but the seal of prophecy and it is Muhammad who was followed, you might say, to the exclusion or superseding all the other prophets. Muhammad's testimony, Muhammad's um, uh, precedent is the basis and not the precedent of Moses or Jesus or anyone else. The second of the five pillars is prayer, salat. It is an Aramaic word, salota, which meant prayer in general. Christians and uh, Jews use the same term. Uh, prayer is five times a day. Uh, Muhammad learned about this by ascending to heaven and learning there that God told him, you should pray 50 times a day. He goes down to the fifth heaven and Moses says it's too much. They argue back and forth and go from 50 down to five. Uh, in any case, one of the interesting things about this is that Muhammad has to journey to Jerusalem and up to heaven in order to learn about five prayers a day, as opposed to having this revealed in the Quran specifically as five times. It's a good example of how the practice of Muhammad generates the specific details of Islamic jurisprudence and of Islamic daily practice and daily ritual. Uh, the term is the same, as I said, it's a pre-Islamic term. Uh, all the prayers have the first chapter of the Quran, which we're going to look at, and the five times are between dawn and sunrise, just after noon, about halfway from noon to sunset, uh, after sunset and before dark, and at night. And uh, I didn't look at today's because I sent the PowerPoint a couple days ago, but last week, uh, the dawn prayer was any time between 5.48 a.m. and 7.25 a.m. The noon prayer was between 12.46 and 3.39. The afternoon prayer between 3.39 and 6.07. The evening prayer between 6.07 and 7.44. And the nighttime prayer as soon as practical after 7.44. And these days you can find Islamic prayer calendars all over the web very easily. Almost every mosque will have these six times on some sort of a clock that they advance every day to tell you what it is. The only exception, is I've seen some mosques where they say, we only do it once a week. But usually they advance it every day and today they use technology. So very often it's automatically done so that you'll know when to have the five times of prayer. Prayer can be very short or very long. The story is told that Muhammad prayed one day, every, every prayer was done very short. My uh, colleague Am Amina Wadud says, about the time for a cigarette break. If you can take a cigarette break, you can take a prayer break and be done with it. The next day or the day before, he prayed very long. Every prayer took a long, long time. The next principle I'm going to discuss is zakat, also a pre-Islamic word. The meaning is merit. And there's also word sadaka, which means righteousness, which is used for alms above the required alms giving. And it can be given to any deserving poor, not only to Muslims. If you go online, you can find zakat calculators, which will tell you how to fill out all the fields. This is from one of them. Don't use women's jewelry. 
uh, used uh, unless it's investment jewelry as opposed to jewelry you actually wear. It will also tell you your primary residence is exempt and there are a few other things that are exempt. Cash on hand, bank accounts, refundable deposit, non-delinquent loans, in other words, you expect to get the money back, tax refunds, gold, shares, stocks, bonds, business cash on hand, business inventory, the nisab is the value of a certain number of ounces of gold, net income, if you are going to get zakat yourself, and you can put all of these in a calculator, uh, subtract your liabilities, and you'll know about zakat. The next of the principles is Ramadan. Uh, Ramadan is the month of fasting. Muslims ab uh, abstain from food, from drink, from sexual relations, and from smoking for the most part for the time period from before the prayer, if they make the prayer that comes before uh, sunrise, until after the prayer that comes at sunset. The month of Ramadan was revealed in, in which the Quran was revealed, a guidance for the people and clear proofs of guidance and criterion. So whoever cites the new moon of the month, let him fast it. The Quran's language encourages Muslims to take a look at the moon, and I have an interesting slide over here. Uh, because of the Quranic dispensation, you have to see the moon in order to know when to fast. It should be obvious, uh, especially after you see this, that uh, this was from February 14th and 15th. The sighting of the moon on February 14th and the sighting of the new moon on February 15th were quite different depending on what time of day and so on. And you can see these bands where it would have been possible. There is always a certain amount of discussion. There is a calculated calendar. Most Muslims don't use the calculated calendar. They use the sighting of the moon. And every year, I am aware at least of Muslims who see the moon themselves or take a couple of witnesses, or Muslims who call their family or they argue or the imam, the leader of the community says, we start fasting today. Fast for 29 or 30 days. Normally, if you see the moon uh, and it's 30 days and you don't see the new moon, that's the end of the fast regardless. And that is the second of the, or one of the uh, festivals of Islam. The final of the pillars we're going to look at is the pilgrimage to Mecca. This is a pilgrimage that every year brings millions and millions of people to Mecca. Mecca was a city not too long ago, which was designed for 150 to 300,000 people. Within the past century, the Saudis built it up so they could handle millions of pilgrims coming in a short period of time. The Bin Laden uh, empire was based on the fact that the father of Osama Bin Laden and many of his many brothers were involved in the engineering, which allowed millions of people to go through a relatively small space in a short period of time. I'm not going to go through all the details, but uh, here is a picture of the Kaaba at the time. Uh, the Kaaba is the, uh, the temple that supposedly was put up by Adam and visited by Abraham and certainly was circumambulated by Muhammad. And there are various stages of the pilgrimage over a small number of days, uh, the 8th, 9th, and 10th day of the final Muslim month. Uh, here is just a little uh, chart of the Kaaba. It's nearly square, and it's aligned so that the corners are north, south, east, and west, rather than the sides of the walls. There's also a, a semicircular wall, about this high, about five feet. And inside that wall, but not inside the Kaaba, are the traditional graves of Ismail and Hajar, Ishmael and Hagar, the uh, concubine and the son of uh, Abraham. And some, not too far from the doorway of the Kaaba is a well that supposedly they drank from and a stone that Abraham is supposed to have knelt at when he worshiped at the Kaaba. It's not the only pilgrimage place in Islam. And we are now during a period of 40 days between the anniversary of the defeat of Imam Hussein, the grandson of Muhammad in the field of Karbala. Karbala is about 90 miles, 60 to 90 miles south of, um, of Baghdad. 
And uh, during the period of 40 days, starting from the anniversary of his defeat, there are also millions of Shiites who come to Karbala to visit the mosque that was built on that location. Uh, in addition, they visit the grave of Ali, the son-in-law and cousin of Muhammad, and a number of other graves that are in the same area of southern Iraq. Ashura, the tenth day of the first Islamic month, is a very, very strange Islamic practice. I do not have any time to talk about it, unfortunately, <coughs> because we're going to look at the beliefs very, very quickly. The first one is God, <coughs> and is for Islam, uh, God is one, God is incorporeal, God was neither begotten nor does he beget, he has no equals. The uh, chapter 112 of the Quran uh, is probably anti-Christian, although it is probably a version of Christianity that was assumed to be highly Marianist, or to put it this way, not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but Father, Son, and Holy Consort, you might say, um, are what seem to be objected to by Islam. Angels, my Muslim students today have a much stronger belief in angels than uh, is typical even among Christians who believe in angels in a very gen uh, generic way. Prophets, as I mentioned, all, most of the, many of the lead prophets of Old Testament <coughs> Uh, Jesus is considered to be a prophet. Yahya, John the Baptist, is considered to be a prophet. Some of the people whom we in the West, in the, I'll say the Jewish and the Christian traditions, think of as kings or teachers are considered to be prophets in the Islamic discourse as well. The main prophets brought books. The Quran is part of a series of books, the Book of Abraham, the Book of Moses, the Torah or Torah, the Book of Jesus, not the Gospels, but the Book of Jesus himself, which is called Injil, which we have to understand as derived from Evangelon. But here Injil means Jesus' book, not the story about Jesus. And I talked already about judgment and divine power. A few salient points about Muhammad. Muhammad lived from about 570 to 632. Uh, his first revelation was when he was an adult, in 610, uh, although notice as part of a very typical religious discourse, 570 to 610, he was 40 years old, not at all dissimilar from many other discourses about reaching maturity and then revealing divine scriptures. He began teaching in public in 612. He taught in Mecca, his hometown, for 10 years. He moved from Mecca to Medina, about 250 miles away in 622. <clears throat> By 632, most of the Arabian Peninsula had pledged loyalty to Muhammad. Many of the tribes had become Muslims in the sense of openly adopting belief in the one God and claiming that Muhammad was the prophet. So within those 10 years from leaving Mecca, basically because he was scared he would be killed, until actually a little bit before that, 630, there was a tremendous change in the fortunes of the early Islamic uh, community. Uh, I'll just say that the practice of Muhammad is called Sunnah. When we talk about Sunni Muslims, they give priority to what Muhammad did, what he said, or what was done in his presence when he agreed to it. Uh, the act, the word, and the silence of Muhammad. What is the Quran? Well, the Quran <coughs> was uh, revealed first in this very cave. My Muslim students have all reported going to this cave when they visited Mecca. It's up in the mountains, not too far from the city. Uh, it was uh, revealed over a period of about 22 years. The first revelation had to do with creation. The last revelation was, today I have completed your religion. And in the middle there was very little narrative. The Quran is not presented as a kind of continuous narrative like you have in Deuteronomy through Kings or like you have in the individual Gospels. Uh, there is some narrative, there's a lot of poetry, there's a lot of exhortations, there's a lot of recollection. Remember what you learned about this or that prophet. And there is legal material. 
This is the first chapter. I'm not going to read the entire chapter. A quick review of this chapter. It sounds an awful lot like any monotheistic prayer. And this is part of the Islamic prayer ceremony that's done five times a day by all Muslims. Now, what is in the Quran? The most controversial materials have to do with the uh, defense and no compulsion and sword verses. So here is the defensive fighting verse. Kill them whenever, whenever, wherever you find them. Drive them out from whence they drove you. Persecution is severer than slaughter. But notice that in 2.190 it says don't exceed the limits. And it limits jihad fighting in, for the name of Islam only to people who fight with you. And people, God doesn't like people who do things in excess. Many progressive Muslims consider this to be on the one hand, a warrant for fighting defensively, but also a prohibition for the kind of excesses that many jihadists, people who call themselves mujahideen, uh, do. <clears throat> the sword verse is understood by many Muslims to be fight everybody, aggressive Islamic expansionism by the sword. Slay the idolaters wherever you find them, take them captives, besiege them, and lie and wait them in every ambush. But if they repent and keep a prayer and pay the poor rate, leave their way free to them. Uh, the sword verse is said by some Muslims to abrogate every other verse, and this is a very real issue. Nevertheless, there are a couple of other verses. There is no compulsion in religion. The right way has been distinct from error. Anybody who disbelieves in the Satan and believes in God, notice there is no reference to believing in Muhammad here. That person has a firm handle. And the idea of the firm handle was in a very important part of Islamic discourse. It was a name of a magazine set up by reformers in the early 1900s in Paris. And there's also the uh, synagogue and churches verse. If God did not check one set of people by means of another, there would surely have been pulled down monasteries, churches, synagogues, and mosques, in which the name of God is commemorated in abundant measure. This verse the synagogues and churches verse seems to suggest that synagogues, churches, all places where God is mentioned, and remember, this is Allah mentioned in synagogues and churches. All those places have status, and the Quran says it's good that we have those things. So we have different approaches to the issue. I added a slide about egalitarianism because I figured the uh, equality state probably needed a little bit more about it, plus we discussed it in the courses that I'm teaching at the University of Wyoming. The story goes that Muhammad was asked, well, you're talking primarily about men. Where are the women in all of this? And God began to reveal, that's the Islamic discourse, egalitarian verses. Muslim men and Muslim women, believing men, believing women, obedient men, obedient, these are obedient to God. Truthful men and truthful women, patient men and patient women, humble men and humble women. In other words, the Quran specifies that this is about men and women. Many of the biblical verses are only about men. Or what New Testament texts, uh, text and Old Testament texts will often say, wives are obedient to husbands, or having a way in which there is not the egalitarianism that many Muslims see in this and similar verses in the Quran. Here's another one, the beginning of the chapter on the women. Reverence your Lord, who created you from a single soul. This word is grammatically feminine, nafs. And created his mate is the translation, but the Arabic zawj is masculine. In other words, you have nafs, grammatically feminine, and the mate is grammatically masculine. You can make whatever you want about this, but this is not Adam, which is grammatically masculine, and Hava, the Eve, which is grammatically feminine, as well as being perceived as male and female, specifically. You have here a very different way of looking at it. One more example, O mankind, we, compare, we created you from a single pair of a male and female, made you into nations and tribes that you should know one another. And the one who is most righteous is not the male over the female, but the one who is uh, most righteous, atka, uh, taqwa means fearing God, like in the sense of uh, Joseph 
and the midwives and a number of other people are depicted as God-fearing in biblical texts. The Quran has 114 chapters. Here's an example of it. I'm not going to talk too much about the religious calendar. We looked at the um, Ramadan and the pilgrimage, and I mentioned Ashura. I'm only going to add that Fridays is the day in which Muslims gather for prayers. It's not really a Sabbath. The Muslims don't have this idea they can't work on the Friday. They do have an idea they can't work during the prayer time for an hour or two. <clears throat> and we talked about Sharia. I'm going to skip ahead to some stuff about the situation here in America. 1994, there were a, under 1,000 mosques. By 2000, there were 1,200. By 2011, there were 2,100 mosques. Uh, Ihsan Bagbi has argued that counting mosques is probably a better way to assess the size and the strength of the Islamic community than attempting to count Muslims, which is very difficult. Mosques are institutions. You can put your fingers on them. You can try to guess how many people have multiple memberships. Muslims are overwhelmingly born in, uh, well, in one of three places. The United States, 35%, Arab region, 24%, South Asia, only 18%, although I think the South Asian contingent has risen since this um, uh, chart was made. This is the Pew Research Center. I think it's 10 years old. In the United States, there are many converts to Islam, African Americans, but there are also Latino and Latina converts and white, you know, Caucasian mainstream Muslim, uh, uh, individuals who decide to become Muslims. And uh, there was a time, and probably still is a time, in which many, many of the mosques have an ethnic profile. Here in Wyoming, very often in the small places, they're very often South Asian profiles because it's one or two extended families. Uh, the largest mosques in Wyoming are in southeastern Wyoming. You can see from the map over here that the southeastern corner of Wyoming has a fairly high percentage of Muslims in America, but that's because Cheyenne and Laramie have Muslim communities and they don't have large populations in global American terms. Here are the numbers from the 2010 uh, archives based partially on census material, based partially on other sources. Uh, Albany County and Laramie County, 308 Muslims, 408 Muslims. You don't have many more uh, stuff than that. I wanted to add one or two final comments before I have to stop see how much time I have to make these comments. I promised you that I wouldn't have enough time to talk about activist adherence. I will say, however, that very often in our society we have simplistic responses to complex modernity. Sometimes you need binary solutions, but very often believing that the simple response is the correct response to something complex is a recipe for disaster. I think Islam is growing in the United States in part because many people who are not happy with Christianity are looking for roots, whether it's in the Islamic period in Spain or among the African Americans, a perception that many slaves were Muslims. But it is a question of going back to roots. Maliz Ruthven, who wrote a textbook that I use in one of my courses, has talked about the fact that Muslims combined temporal and spiritual power, but authority was always checked by the Quran as being one of the strengths, but also one of the weaknesses. It was not strong as the king or the church in overcoming tribalism, as was the case in the Christian world. Finally, I'm going to mention that lots of things have failed in Arab-majority countries. Secularism, statism, globalism, colonialism, tribalism, Islamic leadership, all these things have failed in these countries. The idea of Islam as the answer, a motto of the Ikhwan al-Muslimin, is particularly strong. And so, if you ask me, those are some of the explanations for what activates Middle Eastern activists. In the United States, after 1965, the immigrants were largely better educated. 
our e pluribus unum has allowed for a far better integration of Muslims into our society than was the case in many European locations. Our profile in America, no matter what we think, is nowhere near as controversial as the issues in Spain, in Germany, in France, and Britain. I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much for your attention.